Um, welcome to our panel discussion, Women Driving STEM. It's so glad to see all of you. Um, my name is Marcia Lehman and I'm the Associate Executive Director for American Friends of Hebrew University in the Midwest region. Um, we are otherwise known as AFHU. And AFHU is a, non, is a national non-for-profit charitable organization. We exist to connect the passions of Americans to the talent at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which of course is one of the world's most distinguished academic and research institutions. In addition to raising awareness and funds for the university, AFHU helps the university recruit and retain outstanding faculty, which you will see today, build teaching and research facilities, and provide scholarships and fellowships to those students in need. AFHU's support helps the university advance human understanding in so many fields, including computer science, agriculture, astronomy, energy, psychology, medicine, and so much more. Uh, before I introduce our host, um, I'd also like to say special welcome for uh, Beth McCoy, our chief executive officer, chief executive officer, who is on the on the Zoom call as well. And now I'd like to welcome our host, Amy Allswang, who's an AFHU friend and supporter, who will introduce all four of our superstar scientists. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please put them in the chat room and I, we will try to get to as many questions as we can. For those of you who have access to video, we'd like to see you. So please turn on your video. <laughs> and if you would like on the right top corner where you see view, the view, the, the word view, you can change that to speaker view. So then when each time someone speaks, you will see each speaker. Take it away, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to see you all today. My name is Amy Olswing, and I will be your host for this very exciting panel discussion, Women Driving STEM. I have the honor of introducing our incredible panelists and moderator, top-notch Hebrew University women scientists. I'm sure all of you have heard of Gal Gadot, the Israeli actress who played Wonder Woman in both movies, but let me tell you, these women are true, real-life Wonder Women. So we're very excited to have them today. I'm going to give you a short bio on each woman, uh, on each woman, but their full bios are on the AFHU website. So please go to that. So first is Dr. Naomi Habib. She's an assistant professor at the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Brain Scientists at Hebrew University is focused on studying age-related pathologies such as Alzheimer's disease. Professor Natalie Kubalaban is a professor of biological physics and heads a laboratory in the physics department at the, university, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Balaban served as the co-initiator of the Teacher Scholar Program for Improving Science Teaching in High Schools. Dr. Mayan Salton is an assistant professor at the Hebrew University's Faculty of Medicine and Institute for Medical Research, Israel and Canada in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Her lab is researching the genetic regulation of pre-mRNA splicing and use of molecular biology techniques and high uh, throughput throughput sequencing, sequencing to uncover the layers of alternative splicing regulation for the purpose of therapeutics for cancer. And finally, Professor Hermona Sorek was trained at Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, the Weizmann Institute of Science, and the Rockefeller University. She holds a Schlesinger Chair in Molecular Neuroscience and is a founding member of the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Brain Science. She pioneered the application of molecular biology and genomics to study of brain to body signaling in men and women and in health and disease. Welcome.
So Hermona, we can begin now. Panelists. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> we have it's prepared a set of questions. Each of us would answer a couple of those. And those might outline the path of the career at different times and ages for all of us at the Hebrew University. So the first question is, when did you decide you wanted to make your life's work in the field you have chosen? And who's answering that? Okay, so I think uh, I'll start. So I re you said that we'll hear about ages, so I'll start from a very young age. Not that I knew what's going to be my career, but just the interest into uh, mathematics uh, started when I did Aliyah with my mother at the age of eight from France and ended up in in a primary school, not understanding a word of what was going on around me. And uh, luckily in the class, there was a multiplication chart. You know, this multiplication chart with uh, all the numbers and the multiplication up to 12 or something. And I was just sitting there and staring at this chart for hours, not understanding anything else around. And I just, you know, I was quite fascinated by the numbers, the symmetries of the chart. And I started, you know, just playing games of looking at the numbers and finding all kinds of, of laws in this chart. It was like a game and I would sit in the class and just stare at the multiplication chart. Of course, it didn't help advance my Hebrew. <laughs> I really looking at it and Turns out that uh, maybe two years later, when I, our math uh, teacher, who was teaching, you know, the regular arithmetic that you learn in primary school, and which was absolutely boring, she suddenly told us, "Look at the multiplication chart on the wall and tell me if you see some laws, something." And I was amazed that. Uh, what these games that I was playing, she's interested in that. So I started saying all kinds of things and she was quite supportive. And I suddenly realized that this is true mathematics, not the boring arithmetic that we are taught in class. And from then I was hooked to study. I knew I would study mathematics. This was clearly the aim. So thank you, Stephanie. So in, in Part of your answer, you also told us that the teacher impact, well, had a major impact on your choice. And that is actually true for me too. I had a teacher in high school who is a professor emeritus at the Weizmann Institute today. And he said, you'll be a biochemist. And there is a program at the Hebrew University that invites children to come and spend the summer. So I want to submit your candidacy. And I actually came to the Institute of Life Sciences where I am today. I spent three weeks and I didn't want to go home. So I came to my mom and I said, don't we have any aunt in Jerusalem where I can stay the rest of the summer? And of course, everyone has an aunt in Jerusalem in Israel. So I found the aunt in Jerusalem, which, who actually ran the chemistry lab at our campus. And I spent the summer in the home. And when I came home, I knew what I want to do for the rest of my life. So that's, it's also a, always a teacher, which in a way is what we are. So. Let's hope we have a similar impact of our students today. So the next question was, was there someone who influenced or inspired you along your journey? Which is uh, in a way just what we discussed, except if anyone wants to add something on that. 
Uh, I can add. Uh, thanks, Hermona. So I think it's actually a hard question because I think there are many people who influ influenced me along the way. And in a way, there are the scientific mentors that I had. And on the other hand, I think more uh, influences from home. So my family are actually non, none of them are scientists, but you get influence and inspiration from, I think, many aspects of life. So from my scientific mentors, like my PhD advisors, uh, Hannah Margalit and Nir Friedman, I really learned the power of integrating computational biology, the biology with computer science which they were pioneers of, or my, my advisors at MIT were, showed me the power of technology and technological innovation that I hope I'm taking that with me as I go along. But I think my greatest inspiration actually comes from home and from my non-scientist family, where they were all uh, incredibly um, inspiring in the sense of uh, what can you aspire for and achieve in life. Um, for example, my parents were both very dedicated for what they were doing. And I saw my, my father, for example, working very hard in trying to improve the life of many populations, underprivileged people in Israel and succeeding so much in doing so just by working and being so dedicated for what he's done. And I've seen my grandparents who found, were, worked so hard in founding Israel actually and all that they uh, achieved. So I was really very close to my family throughout the world. And there are so many points of inspiration, but I'll just mention one, which is my grandmother here in Israel. So she was born in Jerusalem and she grew up here. And I think the city of Jerusalem is really part of her DNA somehow. And uh, she uh, went to uh, one of the first uh, schools for women that was founded by the Baroness Evelina de Rothschild. And they studied in English. It was during the uh, British uh, era of Israel, before Israel was founded. And, uh, and she learned some sayings. So one of her sayings was that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And the other one was that if there is a will, there is a way. And she kept saying that to us throughout our, our life. She kept saying, if, and you know, it could be the soups that she made or anything unrelated, but she kept saying, if there is a will, there is a way. And unfortunately, as she grew older, she got Alzheimer's disease and was really devastated to see the effects of this disease. It really drove me to study this, but she did not forget these sayings. So she might have not, at the end of her day, she might have not recognized me, but she kept telling me, if there is a will, there is a way. And I felt that was like kind of her unwritten uh, uh, legacy for us to continue and try and find a solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nomi. So why did you choose the specialization that you're in? Whose role is in this? How come you are doing what you're doing? <laughs> Would you like to start? Me? <laughs> I think I, I, it's actually, I answered it partially. I think partially it's what I just, I think the story I told about my grandmother is part of it, but it wasn't the only part. I think I studied I started by studying computational biology, which is just a unique combination of computer science and biology. And I try, and as I matured along different stages, especially in my postdoctorate, I wanted to find a field where this specific, I, I realized that this is like some strength that, that was actually, the Hebrew University is a leader in computational biology. Now it's kind of spread throughout the world, but when I, as my earlier stages, it was very unique. And I wanted to find a field where it could make a difference in a way where we can take these skills of adding computer science and genomics and making a real difference in the world. And I found that when you take that and integrate this with neuroscience, there's so much to discover. So very soon I 
you know, also winded up into looking at aging and Alzheimer's from because of my background. But mm -hmm. uh, going into neuroscience was kind of a hunch that this could be beneficial. And Natalie, why did you choose biophysics? So from mathematics, mathematics. Uh, you, I, you understand that actually it's used to describe the world, which is kind of very surprising. How come things that are mathematical games are actually very useful for describing the world? And this is what we, what physicists have been doing for, for many, many years. And what I wanted to see is how, how we can apply it also to biological problems. And eventually got really, really attracted to solving real world problems you know it's really nice to play mathematical games but when you see that it can have really an impact on taking a hard problem and the hard problem is why do people die from bacterial infection in hospitals when we have perfectly good antibiotics right it's a very tough problem and it turns out when you translate this problem into mathematical terms suddenly the mathematics acts as a magic wand and you start understanding things that are beyond your simple, you know, we are, our mind is limited, but the translation into mathematics suddenly opens avenues that we couldn't foresee before. And that's fascinating to apply this kind of approaches to real, uh, real world problems. Thank you. I, I actually think that we each select our fields based on what is new and exciting and available in, uh, at the period when we have to select a field. And uh, I was fascinated by RNA for many years and it's a wonderful thing now to learn that it becomes a reality. Everyone talks about RNA therapeutics. Isn't that great? It's a real thing. It's not only in the lab. It makes a difference. Okay, so what is our next question? As a woman in science, were there any firsts that you can think of that impacted you? Are there any obstacles? And of course, we know there are no obstacles. Definitely not to women in science. <laughs> but. And in a way, we started covering the first. Is it interrelated? Was the first realization linked to specific obstacles? Who would like to take that challenge? <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think that the first time that I really encountered um, a difficulty um, in pursuing my career was a time that actually many women find um, problematic. And it's when I had to travel for a postdoc. And so because of the social timetable in Israel, uh, we usually uh, give birth early and so when you have to travel to do a postdoc, you already have a family, uh, which make things more complicated. Yeah. And I think that I found that when I had to uh, travel and convince my family to travel with me, it was challenging not only to convince my spouse, but also to convince my own family because the man is a breadwinner and he has won the bread for our family for the time that I was doing my PhD. And suddenly stepping aside and letting me lead the way was difficult, not only for him, but really for my own family, which was surprising to me because they were always supportive. But when the time came, it seems difficult to, to decide that he's gonna leave his prestigious job and follow me and maybe even stay home and support me. And it was a real challenge. It was a difficult time for me, but I was 
strong. And I believe I was strong because I had strong role models. Like we talked about, um, sometimes it's a teacher. Sometimes it's your grandmother. My grandmother was there um, as a strong figure in, in my life. And I did it. It was a moment in time that it was really difficult, but it paid off not only for my own career, but I feel that it paid off because my daughters see me as leading the way and my students look at me and see that it's possible. And so it was an obstacle and I see that my students go through that, but, um, and actually now that I'm a PI and I'm, already a researcher at the university, many times I speak to students, we actually have like gatherings for them to help them go through uh, this time that they have to believe in themselves and um, carry their family on their back and um, <laughs> travel to do their postdoc. And so it's, it's a difficult time, but I always tell them it pays off. So. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And I'm sure each of us had gone through a parallel stage. Sustainability and kids and went to New York on my own because my husband couldn't leave Israel and I would not recommend that to any, any of my students. But as you say, it was a high price and it paid off. Anybody who wants to add on that? So let's move on to the next question. What is the most important project that you're currently working on at the Hebrew University that you can share with us? And uh, Nomi, you already answered. And Natalie, you already answered. So Mayan again. Yes. What is your oh. favorite project? So actually we have a very exciting project. Okay. which started when I had to do my first mammography, which was not pleasant and was actually very painful. And so I went back to the lab and I thought to myself, really, is that what we have to, like, is this really the best way um, to diagnose breast cancer? And so my lab also um, studies RNA, like Hermona's lab. And... So we know that we have RNA in our body and that runs in our body, in our fluids, in the blood, in saliva, and that it actually indicates our health. And so what we thought about doing, which was somehow crazy, but it worked. And so we took saliva from breast cancer patients and also from healthy women and we checked whether we can actually find a, an RNA molecule that will tell us that this woman has breast cancer and the other one doesn't. And when you think about it, it's non-invasive. You can maybe even um, collect it and send it by, by mail. And it can give you an indication whether you actually need to go to the doctor and get an examination and it's actually very good because we don't check. So even worldwide, we don't check women between the ages of 20 and 40, but those women actually do get breast cancer. And sometimes it's even um, really aggressive type of breast cancer. And so if we can offer those women uh, this type of test that is cheap, non-invasive, and something that you can even do every half a year and it's not painful, then it can be a real uh, revolution. And it's also a revolution for women because it's not just that I chose to work on this specific cancer. It's like, and it was a, um, a project that was led. We were all women, the physicians that collected the saliva, my amazing student who did the, um, the project. So it was done by women for women. And so, it's a really exciting project. So Mayana, let me, can I interrupt? Because this is, this is a really good question that Robin 
uh, Tavel has. She wrote, um, that is amazing. What is the sensitivity of the test? Can it detect even the smallest bit, bit of cancer, like a stage one? That's a great question. It's exactly what we're doing right now. And so we're collecting saliva from women and um, we know that um, some percentage of them will um, have breast cancer in the future. And once they do, then we're gonna go back to the samples that we collected half a year ago to see whether we could then detect if they have cancer. Because yeah, up until now, we did it with women that already had cancer. And so that definitely that's something that we are doing right now. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, that, that was a great answer too. And actually we have another question about it. Um, so Sharon Kamlik asks, would you take a look at colon cancer next? I guess the question, really the broader question is, what does this mean for other cancers? It can definitely work for other cancers. Um, we, we started with breast cancer, but definitely it can be very broad. Okay, so that'll answer your question, Joan. Joan had that question, only for breast cancer, could you be for uter uterine or and ovarian? And yes, I guess the answer is yes, it could be broader. Thank you, thank you for those questions. Those are great questions. And our next question is, do you think that women scientists differ from men scientists? And if so, in what ways? Let's take okay. that heavy load. That's, that's another one that I can answer. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think, I think it's true. I, I think we are different. Um, and it's because women and men are different, I think. And so while boys sometimes um, like play games that are not necessarily collaborative, as girls, we usually are maybe encouraged or maybe, I don't know, it's our nature. We like to collaborate. And so as a scientist, I think that even though academia doesn't always encourage us to collaborate because it looks at what I did and how independent I am. So even though we're not encouraged, I really enjoy collaborating with other scientists. And um, in that sense, I think I'm different. It might also be a problem because maybe women are less competitive. Um, and that's also something that we have to ask ourselves whether we need to win in a man's world or maybe we can just change the rules and win in our own. <laughs> or widen the scope of that world to become men and women world. Well, I have a grandson who says that he told his friend about me and his friend says, come on, nobody has a grandmother in Wikipedia. So. Some of them others are in Wikipedia, what can I say? Okay. And we are asking the more difficult questions as we go along. And the next question is, have you ever felt you won something because you were a woman? Maybe you won the idea to test for breast cancer thanks to having a mammography. So that's a win. I agree. I, I uh, always encounter people who say, well, we need a woman for this group. And I am really against being included in any group because of my sex. That's irrelevant. But definitely we are exposed to other experiences and that might widen the scope of the questions we ask. Plus the collaborative uh, behavior that you corrected, correctly noted. Okay, so one before last, what is your ultimate goal for your life's work? How do you want to be remembered? I think I can answer that as the okay. as a, a quite early on during my career. So I think I can. Uh, it's important to have big dreams, though. 
But remember that this meeting is recorded and we may come <laughs> so back to you in 10 years. 20 years and yes. ask what's changed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so I can't promise I'll achieve it, but I definitely have a very clear uh, goal. And I think we want to change the uh, trajectory of uh, aging and changing, not expanding. So modern medicine expands the lifespan, but currently doesn't expand the life quality as we grow older. And we, and, and, uh, we definitely have now new tools and new ways to study the brain that we didn't have before. And I'm very confident we could change the way that we're uh, actually uh, treating uh, many of the aging related diseases. And the major goal here is to actually treat before the clinical symptoms. So mm -hmm. doing, uh, for example, in Alzheimer's, the, every, all the discussion, the clinical discussion starts when you already have some kind of mild cognitive impairment. And this is definitely too late. So we want to change that. We want to change it to early detection and prevention instead of treatment. And I, I have no doubt it will happen and I hope I'll have uh, an important contribution to it as well. Yeah, I often think that neurodegenerative today is what cancer was 50 years ago when nobody mentioned the word because there was not, not much that could be done. Natalie, how would you, would you like to be remembered? I don't know if I want to be remembered, but I, <laughs> I think what, what, I, what I would like to, 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 to solve really and to, and to know that, that now it's not a problem anymore are all these, I'm, I'm sure many of our audience here have the experience of having an elderly friend or family man that enters the, universe, the, the hospital for a simple procedure and ends up unfortunately dead because the bacterial infection that sh we should have been able to treat and prevent. And if we can really make sense of all these patients that had this, and what, what, what we've seen is that there, there are special bacteria that actually go to sleep in an infection. And we are not used to think that bacteria may go to sleep in an infection, we are used to think that bacteria are actually actively growing. And all the antibiotics that we use are for actively growing bacteria. And this, if, if this phenomenon that we understood uh, of these dormant bacteria in bacterial infection that are very hard to treat, uh, if the ideas that we have of how to actually treat them, which is a bit different than what is done in the hospitals actually, if it actually turns to saving many lives, to shortening the hospitalization times of uh, so many people with bacterial infection, I think that would be, that would be great. Yeah. It that sounds be. like a great goal. Marianne, would you like to think about remembering? <laughs> So I want to think that science advances so fast. I mean, we can see this year. And so maybe I'm not going to remember as a scientist, but rather I want to remember to be remembered as the voice inside my students had telling them that they can do it to believe in themselves. Because I think that many times, um, we as women, we don't believe in ourselves enough to have the courage to try. And so that's how I, I want them to have this voice in their head telling them to believe in themselves. That's what I, that's what I would want. That's a wonderful wish. Thank you so much. This is a great response. Uh, Marsha, do you want to look at the questions if there are any? Yeah, you are muted. You're still muted. Whoops. Oh, okay. okay, there you go. Okay, yeah, so I have several questions here. Um, I have some really good questions. Okay, so Joshua Cohn asked, um, what does a, I'm gonna say, what does a regular day at work look like for you all? Oh, wow. 
That's a good question. It is a good question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the question is today at the Zoom time or in a regular day when we really go to work and talk to our friends and students and family. So what does your day look like? Natalie, would you like to start? Um, how, uh, actually, we, we have decided that uh, we do our best, even now with uh, the, the corona, and uh, we found a place for each student to be uh, alone when it works, and we make shift in the lab. So actually, the lab is full, and we are working, and my day currently is very similar to any other day during the year, which is, it took us time to get there, but now it's up and running. Yeah, we do the same. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, so there was a very big change from a couple of years ago to now, because of a couple of years ago, I still had my kids home, and then they, they both joined the army. So when they joined the army and suddenly they weren't home during the week, it was like a completely different planet to be on. Okay? <laughs> so before I would get up in the morning, take them to, to school, because I drove them every day to school from day one to, to the army time, make sandwiches, run to the lab, <laughs> start uh, looking at the experiment that we're running. I'm still doing experiment. This is something that I really like doing so and and then I would get about 10 phone calls during the day to try to arrange things that you know like uh, the violin lesson and uh, the karate class and who picks who from who right <laughs> sure you all know that and then um, run home to pick one of the kids from swimming, karate, violin, whatever. And, um, and then uh, after they went to bed, I would okay. often go back to the lab or just work on articles at home, but mostly work back to the lab. So this oh, was so the previous so, plan. So, so did you join the Schnitzel Brigade now? We have in Israel the, the tradition of families going to visit our soldiers with lunch for oh, Saturday, and we call that the Schnitzel Brigade. Oh. <laughs> so yes, you go to Nordis, next Saturday you go south, next Saturday you go north, right? <laughs> of course, cooking and preparing uh, the boxes, uh, the, the, the boxes oh. with all the goodies for the soldiers during the week. So yes, of course, every week. Yeah. I'm sending uh, food uh, and treats and, 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 and letters, of course, right? Uh, you know, these yeah. are the times where you go back to write actual letters and not emails anymore. Yeah. yeah. So I have two questions that are really related and one is really quite amazing. So um, I'm going to ask them together because I think they're interrelated. So Robin Tavel is asking, First, if you find that young girls in Israel are more interested in science, how, ma high, how might that be different in Israel? And she's thinking about her two middle daughters. And the second question, which is somewhat related, is from Renee Copland, which is so amazing. She's a high school principal, and she has high school students here listening and watching this panel at discussion, and she would like to know what would you say to them. So wow. I think they're both related. Yeah, yeah. I'll be yeah. I'll be happy to answer. This is okay. an amazing question. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure about the first, comparing U.S. and Israeli STEM uh, curriculum. I'm not sure, but I'm only based on the time I spent in Boston, which is probably a very STEM oriented. Uh, region of the US. Um, so I don't think Israel has a better orientation for for encouraging women to go into science than 
some of the schools, at least I, I saw in the US. But if I compare uh, the way I grew up, which like, uh, and probably as you go even further away, I think there's been a huge leap in, under, in uh, really promoting women in science from a young age. And I think we all heard these stories now that it starts at a young age. I think from, for myself, I was actually encouraged to go into kind of more literature because it was appropriate for women. Yeah. And I had to discover myself, I actually like life and uh, life sciences and, and mathematics. But for young women, I think the most important thing is that don't put limits to yourself. Try to find what your passion is. STEM, we all find STEM as amazing, but it is very personal, right? So you're definitely proud, you're definitely very uh, talented in some direction, but it's very important to find your real passion and then not to see any borders uh, around you and be confident that you could do, you could go in the direction you pursue regardless of any maybe social conventions, regardless of any maybe pressure from, from your peers. And as long as you do something that really drives you, that you, when you just walk in the street, suddenly you have an idea about something these are the things that are, that show that you're really passionate about something. As long as you do that, you you have a really very fulfilling uh, life. So for me, science is an incredibly fulfilling life, and especially in academia, it's it's amazing how much we continue to learn every day while we work until the the day we stop. So that's amazing. Uh, but really, don't don't try to kind of not listen to anybody who tells you there, there are any borders and any things you can or cannot do. Just believe in yourself and go with that passion. Good. Mayan, anything to add on that? I have another question, but Mayan, are you speaking? No, 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 go ahead, ask. Are you sure? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Sarah, Okun, I hope I pronounced that correctly, is asking, for those of you who are married and or have children, we all do. Right. How do you manage all of your responsibilities and do the men tend to share responsibilities of the family? Yeah, I think I can start with that. To begin with, most of the women scientists in Israel would be married and have children. It's very different from the United States, where a lot of the women scientists see that as an alternative choice that precludes family planning. And, and that is something I'm very proud of, of our society that enables that. But this being said, it definitely takes a partner that shares responsibility. And uh, I think, well, I consider myself fortunate to have uh, lived with such a partner. And it wouldn't work otherwise because family is a huge responsibility, of course, certainly. Anyone who wants to add on that? Um, yeah, I think that um, Hermona is right. I think that, um, we are all married, we all have kids, and I, I think each of us has made a conscious decision to marry someone that will support her career. And so, but even though you're married to someone who thinks you're doing 50-50, <laughs> it's not always so. And it, it, it's mainly because the way I see raising kids is different than the way he sees it. And so still, I think, I feel that I am doing more, maybe not responsibility-wise, but I think that I'm, I'm spending more of my computational brain <laughs> power on thinking about my daughters during my day, um, studying violin lessons, as uh, Natalie says. <laughs> and it is a challenge. And life-work balance is something 
I'm sure all of us think about every single day trying to uh, fine tune it to make it better. But as I tell my students, it's never perfect. It's about the big numbers. Um, choose what you want to do. Choose your battles. Choose the things at home that are important to you and things at work that are important. Learn to say no. And so I practice that every day, uh, striving to become better. But I'm a good enough mom. And um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a struggle. I'll say that. I, I actually wanted to add uh, one other perspective. So I completely resonate with what you said. And I also feel very lucky to have uh, partners uh, a, a kind of joined forces with me. I do have good friends who are even raising kids on their own and they are very accomplished scientists. And I can't imagine how hard it is uh, for them. They find other support systems like uh, babysitters or other support systems. So I wouldn't like determine not to pursue a career given uh, the partner situation. Uh, but I wanted to say something from a different perspective that it's, it's definitely a struggle and I struggle with it every day, but it's also a great blessing. I think I see uh, colleagues who maybe stay, stay at work incredibly late and don't it, and rely on their spouse to take care of their kids or take them from the daycare. Uh, but I have like this harsh deadline in my day where I have to go, I have to take my, I have, uh, I actually had two babies during my postdoc, my second and my third child during my postdoc at MIT. And my lab had no, no one had any babies at all. And they were working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, I think. I wasn't there 24 hours a day. Uh, and I saw that they, actually these breaks that I would take during the day, I would go home. They thought I was resting, but I had to like make dinner and just tell a story and go to the park and do other things. But actually this, these mental breaks are also important for your creativity and for other processes. And generally, I mean, my, my kids give me so much, uh, they're a, a great blessing. They're so amazing. They give me so much support in their own tiny way that uh, I, th I think it's something we don't always, it's hard to balance because at the end of the day, I'm exhausted, but it's, uh, it's also a blessing. So it's important to remember that. I think also, you know, I just want to add, even though I'm not a panelist, but I think FaceTime is overrated. I think through <laughs> years and years and years of working, I think it's really about re results. And um, I think that, you know, I've seen that in my career too, where, you know, sometimes there were situations where, you know, the, you know, men could put in more time than, you know, women could put in. But at the end of the day, I, I do think FaceTime is overrated. I think I think it's more important what you know, whatever results are yielded from your work and your effort. That's what really counts. Um, that's just my two cents, you know. <laughs> um, but I do have a few more questions for the group, and they're really good ones. So, from Frona Khan, she says, "Thank you." Our son, who is a physics professor has suggested that men need to make special efforts to recruit grad and postdocs. Do you see this happening or critical to encourage young women scientists? I am in the US. You're inspirational to all of the young women I counsel in high school and to all of us and to all of us. Okay, so maybe, what is your opinion on that? Okay, maybe I can take that one because uh, be, because of the physics, uh, so it's it's really interesting to see that that uh, the physics professors actually take that very seriously because physics is maybe the the, the faculties where the representation of women is the lowest. Uh, when I joined the Hebrew University, uh, there was no women faculty in my in, in physics. And, uh, and now uh, the Hebrew University has really put an effort to recruit more women. And, uh, and we are four in the department, which is uh, a number that was never seen before. It's like unbelievable, four physicists. 
so I do agree that special effort should be made uh, to, to encourage uh, women to, to go into, into physics, but these efforts have to be made very early because we also have a, a, an underrepresentation of women students, you know, and this underrepresentation gets worse even, but, but it's bad from the beginning. Therefore, uh, actually, we've started an effort to improve science teaching at school, uh, and especially physics. And we, and together with the university, the university is now actively training scientists. It's called the Scholar Teacher Program. They are actively training scientists that are in our labs. So they do research. They are top-notch scientists. They're not PI, but they do, they, they do science. And they bring the science to the classroom and they teach the high school students in Jerusalem. And because they are so close to, to, to what they do, and many of them are women, they are role model for Jerusalem girls to go and study physics. They are actively recruiting girls from, 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 from the middle school to enter physics study in high school. And they are role models. And I think as we saw here, early addressing uh, this, uh, this issue of promoting uh, young girls and telling them physics is hard. The fact that you don't understand many things is fine. Feynman, the Nobel Prize in physics, admitted that there are many things that, that are unclear in physics, but don't think it's you personally. It's not you, it's just a hard field. And the fact that you don't understand is actually good because it means that you are dealing with it and and the problem with, with uh, girls is that this, uh, we, we, we tend to want to be very, very good. And we, if we are not, it takes down our self-confidence and we say, okay, physics is not for us. And, and, and this is exactly what we're trying to address uh, here. And it's great, great to see that other physics professors are trying to do similar things. So that's, that's very interesting, Natalie, because the next question we have was, um, is from Sophia Kantoff, were you ever just, not, not for you necessarily, Natalie, because it's about physics, but it's the other side of it. Were you ever discouraged because of a certain science, like having a huge passion for biology, but struggling with or disliking <laughs> physics? <laughs> Maybe Maya or Nat uh, should answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> so actually, actually, I have to say that I did not like physics at school, at high school. I had terrible teachers, really. None of them was formed in physics. In France, my the, the cooking teacher was forced to be a physics teacher because there was nobody else, right? Oh, so the result is that we did not understand anything. And I thought I don't understand anything because... I'm not good enough for studying physics. I was very good in math and I was intending to study math. Only at the university, I understood that actually physics was for me. So I completely understand that. And teaching physics is hard and we are really doing the best we can to improve it locally in Jerusalem and eventually in the countrywide. Yeah, we, we had a similar problem. I had a very poor mathematics teacher. And then one day my son calls me and says, you have no idea who teaches us math. And I said, whoever it is, it can't be worse than my teacher. And he said, oh, they brought him back because <laughs> there was a lack of teachers in math and physics in Israel. That was before the Russian immigration which solved that problem for an entire generation, I think. Yeah, it, it matters. Who teaches us matters a lot. Yeah. I have one last question, and I think at that point we, we would need to end. And the question was directly from Mayan related to your, your research. Um, the question was, did you test it in a group of women who are not predisposed? Mayan, you're muted. Yes, sorry. Um, so if we tested it in a group of women that were not predisposed to cancer, that means? Yes. Uh, so actually we had a group 
of women that were uh, women that are um, that might get cancer because they have cancer in their family or maybe a genetic uh, a mutation that might uh, cause uh, breast cancer. And so that, but they didn't have breast cancer. And so they were our predisposed uh, breast cancer group, if that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do have one last question and I do think it's a good one. It's from Sophie. Zalavari. I hope I said that right. Uh, you have talked about people who inspired you in your personal surroundings. Are there any female scientists who you personally consider as role models? Okay. I'm surprised we didn't think of that question. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, well, I know new personally Rita Levy Montalcini who uh, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, she's Italian. She was Italian. And she performed research during the Second World War in her kitchen because she was fired from the institute she was working on being named Livy. And, and then after the war, she really progressed in her science she won the Nobel Prize. She was elected to the Italian Senate. And she came to the Hebrew University. She was 91 years old and won an honorary PhD. And she was a grand dame. She was always very elegant, very delicate, beautiful jewelry. And she called me when she was 102 years old. And she said, she would like to join a European research group that I was a member of. And, and she said, I might be old, but I'm scientifically very active. She lived to the age of 103 and she's definitely a role model, yeah. And what was her name? Rita Levi Montalcini. Ooh, that's a mouthful, okay. Yeah. You know, I have to say that, um, we do have to end it here, but I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Amy, thank you, Olswang, for being our host. Um, you will be receiving recording of the discussion, and if you'd like to share it with anyone you know, that would be great. We at American Friends of Hebrew University appreciate all your support, and please visit us at www.afhu.org for news and events about the university. And please feel free to reach out to me at any time if you'd like any information about AFHU, Hebrew University, and faculty members. As we say at AFHU, ingenuity is our tradition. Knowledge moves us. Thank you so much. We enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much for our panelists and our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, all. Thank you.